Thank you so much for this um, extremely nice uh, introduction and for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come to Ireland. It's such a warm and welcoming country and, and community. Um, well, you actually have heard the summary of my presentation, so uh, I will try to expand it a little bit. Um, maybe first by um, starting to answer the obvious question that many people would have. Um, why is the OECD working on that kind of, of issues? The OECD is known as, as an economic organization, and it's true that we do a lot in the field of, of economical analysis and policy advice to countries. But, um, well, let me just frame it a little bit in the, in the background of, of uh, developments in the OECD. Um, when the crisis erupted in 2008, um, we immediately started to, to question um, how would the post-crisis economy look like and what kind of um, initiatives and policies do we have to develop in order to better prepare countries for for moving out of the crisis, but also to prepare the post-crisis uh, economy and society. So we started a huge horizontal work, horizontal meaning going through all the directorates in the OECD, um, on innovation. Um, innovation being, in our view, the keyword of um, how we should look to build the post-crisis economies and societies. Um, but innovation in a very comprehensive, in a very broad sense, not just focusing on, on uh, obvious uh, policy recommendations like we need more engineers or we need more IT people or, or whatever, but looking at what kind of conditions would, should be created in order to move societies in a more innovative way um, and also to build the skills that support that um, movement and you have to frame our work on on arts and arts education in that context so we have been looking at the arts from um, an innovation angle and from uh, a perspective on the kind of skills that we think 21st societies um, will need so the OECD is is still an, an economic organization but we we do not consider ourselves to be purely economic we we have even moved um, economics out of our slogan. So we are, we, our slogan is now better policies for better lives. And we are working on a lot of social issues uh, in, and, and also education being um, the second largest directorate in the OECD. So I'm coming from an educational sector, um, but I'm very happy to, to talk to um, youth work people um, as well because I think um, youth development and skills are uh, a shared matter between various policy fields. I'm coming from a specific unit in the organization, which is the Center for Educational Research and Innovation. That's a, a rather autonomous, strange animal in the big family of OECD. The OECD is not a very central organization. It's a, an archipelago of a lot of different programs and activities and, and organizations. So my center has a relative autonomy. We decide on what we do ourselves. We have um, a baseline funding, which is quite interesting. Um, and we focus, um, in fact, it's the oldest activity in the OECD working on, on these kinds of questions. We have been established in 68 already, uh, long before there was PISA and long before there was uh, all the other work that we are doing now. Um, and we have always been focusing on learning, on the learning sciences, on brain research, on innovation, um, on futures thinking, on diversity issues, uh, etc. So let's say the more imaginative, the more prospective uh, themes in, in the field of education and learning. So that has a little bit the background of where I come from and from what perspective I, I give this uh, talk. Um, I would like to discuss five issues. First of all, the, the question of what kind of skills do we need in the 21st century? Um, and, and, yeah. and then the second question, looking more at the arts as a sector. I know that that's not a primary subject of today, but if people working with arts um, can be seen as developing specific sets of skills, 
then that should be also visible in the art sector itself, where these people then are employed and mobilizing these skills. So it's more from that perspective. I'm not going to make an analysis of the arts sector. It's more an analysis of how people working in the arts demonstrate skills which, are, which could be interesting. And then um, third, focusing specifically on the, on the publication uh, that was mentioned, Arts for Art's Sake, question mark because the question mark is very important in the title. Um, what can arts education or arts learning, because I don't mean education as being just a formalized institutional setting of learning. I mean education, everything that induces people to learn. Um, how can that contribute to development of, of transversal skills? Is, is addressing the arts, is working through the arts conducive to development of other sets of skills, more the academic skills, uh, etc. Um, and then uh, finally, um, and a little expansion on creativity because we would like to do some further work, empirical work uh, analysis on uh, the concept of creativity. Um, and then finally some conclusions. What skills do we need in the 21st century? And I'm starting with a rather Intriguing graph. I, I have presented this graph already a million times, but I always find it so telling and so intriguing. It's a little bit complex. It's based on an analysis of the job input, so the, the tasks in, in the US economy. All the workers in the US economy between 60 and 2000. And then the relative evolution of different sets of tasks, different groups of tasks. So you have five groups of tasks. It's not jobs, it's not professions, but kind of tasks. And any profession will have always a mixture of all of these tasks. Even a medical doctor will have to do routine manual uh, kind of things. So it's, it's not on jobs, it's based on tasks. Um, and what you see is um, something that, that I think everyone would expect, that the routine manual kind of tasks uh, are declining, but not so much as, uh, as many people think. Yeah? So um, routine manual labor still is, is in a very, very important part of the, of the economy. What is much more interesting in this graph and, and something which many people do not realize is that the routine cognitive skills are declining much more rapidly. So the routine cognitive operations, simple uh, cognitive non-manual kind of tasks um, are declining very rapidly. Um, and you have to question yourself in this graph, in our Western education systems, for what kind of tasks do we prepare young people? My answer would say we predominantly prepare them to do routine cognitive tasks. Um, we do prepare them to a certain extent for routine manual labor, um, but that's, that's a specific part, but we, do, we prepare them to do routine kind of cognitive things. And we train them to think routinely, to, to think in routines. Um, what is the opposite of that is the non-routine task. And they all increase except this one, non-routine manual labor, but that's not very interesting for, for our talk today. But these two are incredibly important, and they are becoming a much more important part of the economy. Just imagine that this graph stops in 2000, but of course these tendencies have been accelerating uh, and are now accelerating even during the crisis, because a crisis is always a transformation of an economy and a society. So a crisis is an, a kind of process where a lot of things are destroyed, but also a lot of new things are built up. And so um, if you would expand this graph to the future, then you would see that uh, this period would see an acceleration of these tendencies. Um, the light green here is the non-routine interactive, uh, and we co sometimes call them complex communication tasks. Non-routine meaning um, people have to cope with uncertainty. People have to cope with situations for which they are not yet well prepared, for situations where 
the um, unexpected happens. Um, and that's happening more and more. Eh? Uh, if you talk to employers, it is meeting uncertainty, which is really um, at the front of their, of their ideas of jobs in the future. Um, to be able to make decisions in a context of uncertainty. And um, you, you feel me coming. Concepts like uncertainty, non-routine, are becoming very close to the arts. Because what is an artist? He is dealing with imagination. He is dealing with the unexpected. He tries to transmit a message which is not the obvious one. Um, so the non-routine interactive is a nurse who has to, to deal with all kinds of expected situations, who, who has to deploy very complex uh, ways of communicating with patients, with families, etc. So that complex communication is becoming very, very important in our societies and in, in the kind of tasks that will be expected from young people in the future. And also non-routine cognitive or deep thinking or complex cognitive challenges. Um, also non-routine, dealing with uncertainty, but um, being able to analyze a situation which you have not encountered before. Being able to create out-of-the-box thinking to, to that kind of uh, competencies we are talking about. And they are um, becoming also very, very important. So non-routine analytic or non-routine cognitive. Um, this graph is telling a little bit the same story, but not on different sets of tasks, but on the kind of um, skills levels that are needed in, in, in the economy. And this is based on the uh, very recent uh, adult skills survey that we have published in, in, uh, in October. Uh, I don't know whether people have uh, seen it in the press, but um, we have published a major international survey of adult skills, um, and um, well, a lot of very interesting things are coming out of that survey, but one of the most interesting one is that um, occupations where people are expected to have a higher level of a set of skills, and here uh, are depicted literacy and numeracy skills, but at a more advanced level, that they, these kind of occupations are incredibly um, rising between even 98 and 2004, you see these, this enormous increase. Um, and the uh, occupations with the lowest set of literacy and numeracy skills have stayed rather stable. So th there, is, there is not so much as that low-skilled labor is disappearing. Uh, it's more the middle sector of the jobs which are disappearing. And there is a lot of research on that. Um, and there is a kind of dualization of the labor market uh, and the dualization of the skills needed uh, in, in the economy, which is happening where highly skilled people with the kind of non-routine analytical skills and non-routine cognitive uh, communication skills, they, they have a rather bright future. Um, but it's more the middle sector of the skills distribution, which is at risk, which you see uh, here in these two sets, but the lower skills levels, they still have a, a stable part in, in the job market and the economy. Um, so it's not a linear relationship, but uh, still um, the, the, the job market and the tasks in the, in the economy of the 21st century is changing very dramatically, and that's a very important um, message. Um, there are Many other kinds of similar studies. I'm just showing you one which, and it's maybe not so very visible, uh, but you have here routine, uh, let's say, the normal manual labor, routine resource kind of jobs, routine service, the service sector, which has expanded a lot. Um, but what is interesting here is the jobs which can be called creativity oriented, where it's not purely in the arts or the media. It's any job which has a large creative component. Um, and um, this has expanded, in, in this case in Canada, in the 20th century um, uh, a lot. But there are many similar uh, studies which all point in, in, in the same direction, 
changing kinds of jobs, changing kinds of tasks, uh, etc. A couple of graphs which I want to show you on um, from our research on innovation jobs, um, and we um, analyzed huge data sets uh, which are available um, on what what are the characteristics of people doing innovation oriented jobs. Um, and of course, there is a definition on the lead that I'll, I'm not going to, to go too much into detail. But if you distinguish people working in innovative jobs and people not working in innovative jobs, then you can, can do a, uh, an analysis of what kind of features distinguishes these two groups of jobs. And in this case, um, the, it's the likelihood um, of demonstrating certain sets of skills. Okay. So you have to read this graph. So this is 2.97. So people in innovative jobs have three times the likelihood of demonstrating the skill come with new ideas and solutions. Hmm. So you have to read this graph in this way. So you can see what are the top 10 skills that are expected or that are demonstrated by people working in innovative jobs. And then you see come with new ideas, so imaginative thinking, acquire new knowledge, willingness to question ideas, very, very important. Um, innovation and creativity means as also a destructive element. Um, it, creativity means Questioning some, questioning the old. Um, so willingness to question ideas, alertness to opportunities, um, present ideas in audiences like I'm doing now, analytical thinking, mastery of your own field, coordinate activities, uh, writing and speaking a foreign language, using computers, uh, so the IT skills, and then you can see the list further on. But let's say these top 10 skills all are demonstrated twice as much by people working in innovative jobs than people not working in innovative jobs. Hmm. Um, maybe just expanding a little bit on, on this very important notion of the willingness to question ideas. Th this kind of analysis is also done in, in um, Asian economies. And um, many people think, yes, Asian economies, Chinese, uh, South Korea, etc., the tigers in East China, they are expanding their economy so rapidly. But will that be sustainable in the kind of skills that um, are needed to move that to the next frontier? Um, more specifically, will they be able to step out of the expected and to be really creative? Um, because notions of um, obedience and, and um, being servient to, to, to your uh, manager or to your leader is, are so important in the Asian um, culture. And that's a question which is very much at the, um, at the top of the minds of, of people in uh, leading people in Asia. Um, I have traveled a lot uh, since a couple of years to Asia and we are, do we are doing a lot of work there. Um, and they are very conscious of the fact that if they want to move their economy to a next stage where they have to move out of cheap mass production, then they have to move to a certain change in their culture, but also in the sets of beliefs systems and in the skills that people have. And questioning ideas will become very important. Maybe you uh, remember, I'm, I'm just deviating a little bit from my, from my talk, but you remember the story of Olympus in, in Japan. Um, Olympus being one of the biggest um, photograph companies in, in, uh, um, in Japan. And it nearly went bankrupt last year because there was a kind of financial scandal at the top. And everyone knew and no one questioned. And no one really challenged the leadership for the kind of risky behavior that they, that they were doing. Um, and it came out because um, the, the, the CEO was, was an, an Englishman, 
and he stepped out of the company and brought it into, into the media. And so then it, it erupted and um, actions could be, could be taken, etc. But it was such a, a typical, of course an exaggerated case, but such a typical case of the, the, the problem that Asian economies have in as exactly this kind of um, competencies. Many people say in the West, our economies will be more sustainable in the 21st century. We'll, we will not lose the, the economic um, war with, with the East because we are much more, our culture and our skills um, are much more grounded in this notion of, of falsification and then questioning authority and creativity, etc. But at the same time, um, I think at least that we still need to reinforce that, that tendency and to build on, on this important notion which is already in our culture, but to build on that in our education and in our cultural policies to, to further develop that. So that was a short excursion. There are many um, ways or many uh, attempts to classify and structure a little bit the current thinking on, on the, the skills of, for the 21st century, um, or 21st century skills, like more and more people call them now. Um, this is from a very uh, influential international um, project, which was led by three leading IT companies um, some years ago, Microsoft, Intel, and Cisco. And um, they came together and, um, well, their, their reasoning was, well, we are so much criticizing educational policies, um, but what is our own view of the kind of skills that we expect that people have? Not specifically IT skills, but the, the, the sets of minds, the habits of mind uh, that we expect uh, from people uh, in the future. Not only our employees, but in general. And that's what they came up with. And um, I found it a very interesting, it's, it's rather short, it's rather comprehensive, but uh, I found it very illuminating. So they make a distinction between ways of thinking, and there you have, first of all, creativity and innovation, critical thinking, problem solving, learning to learn, metacognition, then ways of working, communication and teamwork, tools of working, of course here you find IT and information literacy, and living in the world, literacy, uh, citizenship, um, life and career, so the, the personal dimension, and then social responsibility. Um, so I, I think that this is a rather nice short formulation of, of what is expected from uh, people in the 21st century. Um, we have developed more our own approach. This, this is coming from one of our own publications. We think that um, subject-based skills still will be very important. Um, and that's the idea, but that's not the topic of today, that you have to have a, a deep mastery in, in your own subject field in order to be able to move out of that field. You cannot be creative if you are not having a deep knowledge of one uh, subject matter. Um, and then you have very important behavior and social skills. Just for your information, we are working very hard on this sector as well, um, which is it's more called the soft skills. Um, we have done some analysis which is demonstrating that, uh, and not everyone in, in, in the education directorate like, likes to hear that, but that the soft skills are more important than the purely cognitive skills which are tested by PISA. This is not to devalue PISA. We will come out with new PISA results next week, which will be a huge media event. Um, and PISA is very important because I think the basic skills in literacy, reading, and, and mathematics, and science are very important. But that's not to say that they cover everything. So we are now doing some uh, and some, some work on what is actually the importance of more the soft skills, personality traits, perseverance, uh, you mentioned the word resilience, um, that kind of um, skills, but also social skills. Uh, um, so well, next year, I'm, I'm very busy organizing a big meeting in Sao Paulo in Brazil next year, specifically on, on this kind of, uh, of topics. 
And then skills in thinking and creativity, um, critical thinking, ability to make connections, imagination, curiosity, etc. This is the least researched area, of course. This is also the most difficult area to research. We already have so many difficulties in researching this one, but this is uh, absolutely very difficult. So um, I will come back to that uh, during my talk. Okay, uh, so now that we know a little bit about what is expected in the 21st century in terms of, of skills. Um, can we, what is the arts sector itself uh, demonstrating? Um, and I'm showing you this because there are some very interesting results from uh, our analysis. It's not included in the book that was mentioned. Uh, it's included in another publication. But we have looked at in which sector can we find in, uh, innovative people? In which sectors can we detect people who have a highly innovative job? And in, in innovation research, there is a distinction between three kinds of innovation. The first is innovation in, in the product or the, the service that people are delivering. And there, the arts are the, having the most innovative people. Maybe that's understandable, but it's still very interesting to see that the arts are in themselves a sector which is uh, demonstrating a lot of innovation in the job content of people, um, next to, to engineering. Um, if you look to a second form of innovation, which is more based on, on technology, on tools, on instruments, then the arts are uh, sinking a bit compared to the others, but still very um, above the average and, and very interesting. And then the arts uh, are below the average with regard to the third way of defining innovation, which is more at knowledge and methods. Um, but that's also more or less understandable. But in, in the kind of products and services that uh, the arts sector is delivering, it's, it's highly innovative. So what we try to um, demonstrate with this kind of analysis is that the idea that you sometimes very much see with, with government leaders and, and ministers that innovation is something only for more people with technology and mathematics and science, etc. I have nothing against that, but that uh, we should have a much more comprehensive, a much more broad definition of, of um, innovation. Um, I'm just including, because I've I have given this kind of analysis also when I have spoken to people in the humanities. Um, I, last year I was having a similar kind of keynote in a big conference um, in, on uh, the future of the humanities in, in higher education and many people being very concerned that, the, that there is a negative perception among policymakers of, of too, much, too many students choosing for humanities and the arts in higher education. And then I made an analysis link, trying to compare different sets of innovation indicators with different um, profiles of, of countries. And I'm just showing a very simple graph where you have the, on the horizontal axis here the European Innovation Index. It's, it's now having a different name. It's uh, the um, Innovation Union Indicators. Um, and it's based on a composite index, uh, and the more to the right, the more innovative countries are uh, in their economy and society, but also in their educational systems. Um, so the, the, the red ones are what is called in, in this analysis the lead innovative countries in Europe, Switzerland being at the lead, but it's not a EU country, but Sweden, Denmark, Germany, and Finland. And then you have this group of countries where Ireland is, is just included, which are the followers in terms of innovation, but not the leaders in innovation. And, and I try to, to link this analysis with the numbers of students entering humanities and arts in higher education. Um, and I've just attended to, to this uh, circle, having high numbers of students in the arts and in the humanities is not at all uh, an impediment to be a very innovative country. Uh, and you could do the reverse, uh, showing the numbers of engineers and people in the sciences. Um, but I'm more hesitant to do that because I, 
I, I am also very much in favor of ha having more engineers. So I'm, I'm not against something, I'm just saying that the reality is more, it's more diverse and much more complex and there is much more interaction and transfer between the humanities and, and for example, the sciences. Um, uh, if you look at interesting fields of research which are really very highly innovative, that's exactly why, where the humanities, the arts, sciences, engineering, where they talk to each other, where they meet. Um, so, uh, but that's another topic I'm not dealing with this uh, today, but that's, that's certainly one of my favorite um, um, ideas that, that innovation is much more comprehensive than what we use, or many people usually think. Okay, that were a few words on, on the arts sector itself, and now um, coming to the topic of, of the book, um, I'm, I'm just so, yeah, this book, oops. Art for Art's Sake, um, you can download it, most of our publications are available for free, um, and it's looking at the impact of arts education, so it's specifically about the educational sector on um, all kinds of other sets of skills. Um, going back, first, um, a, a little bit of a worrisome graph here. It's, it's a very simple indicator, and of course it, it doesn't say too much, but still it's indicative. It's the um, it's average instruction time in arts subjects in lower secondary education. Um, and the evolution in it. So we, in, in the OECD, we are measuring um, all kinds of indicators for education, and also we look at the evolution of instruction time um, for different subject fields, and this is specifically for arts subjects. Um, and in most countries, there is a, a slight decrease. Some countries have decreased and, and then have increased again. Um, but for your own country and, and for mine as well, it doesn't look good. So I'm coming from Flemish Belgium, um, but in Ireland it's very low and it has decreased even um, since 2002. Um, so the, you cannot say that you are doing a lot in art, on arts education in, in normal school life. Um, it is certainly a subject field which is, um, I would say, a little bit oppressed by all the dominant uh, subject fields uh, in the school's curriculum. Um, if you compare to countries like Finland, Italy, Denmark, Norway, Scandinavian countries are always coming on top of all these kinds of indicators. Um, so it's, it's, um, uh, it's quite a impressive. If it's not, it doesn't have a very strong uh, explanatory power because if we link this kind of analysis to skills distributions in, in, in the young population, you don't see that, that strong correlations. But it's still, uh, uh, f from a policy perspective, an interesting um, indicator. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm doing here. I'm relating instruction time to, uh, again, the same European Innovation Index. So the correlation is 0.35, which is a moderate strong uh, relation, but not that strong, but there is a huge dispersion uh, of countries around the, the, the correlation. So you see that some lead indicators have indeed rather high levels of instruction time on the arts in, in schools curricula. Um, Ireland being here, and my own country also in the same neighborhood. Um, but there are countries who have high levels of um, instruction time who, have, uh, who cannot be considered to be highly innovative uh, and vice versa. So, but, but still, there is some, some relationship. Um, so I will not try to summarize a lot of the empirical research in, in the book. Um, it is a, it's a very detailed <laughs> meta-analysis of hundreds and hundreds of studies in the field, uh, looking at um, how um, arts education in different fields uh, contributes to, uh, let's say, transfer in the more 
important skills domains. Um, and what we, let's say, that what we mostly find is that there are a lot of studies who point to like uh, kind of associations, like correlations, that people who choose for arts or who do music classes or who go uh, to dance classes are also people who, or young people, who demonstrate high levels of skills in literacy and numeracy and collaboration and team working, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a large, a huge correlation. But the problem is, and here you see the an American uh, analysis of SET scores, which are the standardized uh, school aptitude scores um, at the end of, uh, at, I think, lower secondary. Um, and you see this kind of analysis, uh, that the SET scores are higher for people who are um, doing all this kind of uh, artistic activities. But of course the problem is that there is a huge selection effect. Um, it's obviously people from a socially better well off, but social background plays a, a lot of, uh, has a lot of impact, but also cognitive abilities play a lot of it. It's, it's uh, unfortunately the smartest students who also go to music classes. So it's saying that music contributes to cognitive development uh, is of course, uh, from a methodological point of view, um, not correct. So what we find, and this is just um, trying to summarize this, is that you find a lot of correlational studies. Um, for example, um, the impact on um, verbal capacities, but also on, on math. Um, so the correlational impact is huge. But if you really look at, at experimental studies, and there are only very few um, with an, uh, a very sophisticated experimental design where you just randomly allocate students to different sets of treatments. And of course, there is a very strong ethical dimension in experimental studies in education. Can you just deprive people from the best possible education by putting them in a control group where they don't have any uh, arts uh, education for at least two years. Uh, so that's, but that's a different discussion. It's very difficult to do that kind of research in education. But the few studies which are there, they point to a little bit of impact, but, um, but not so much because of selection effects and because of uh, all this. But there are some areas where we find uh, some impact, and there is a very interesting, I think one of the best chapters in the book is on music, um, where of course there is this old idea that music and mathematics are linked, and there is some evidence also in brain research that music is activating the same, the same fields in the brain which are activated during mathematics learning, uh, but of course, music has a very strong mathematical structure, so it is, it is, it's, it's quite understandable that the kind of uh, cognitive operations happening in the brain when, when executing music are very similar to what you do when you are studying math. Uh, so there is this, this uh, connection, but still the um, experimental research is not uh, very convincing. And, especially when you move to the more imaginative kind of, and the more creativity kind of skills. Uh, one of the important messages in the book, but it, it, it doesn't come out very well, uh, I, I must say, uh, it should have, have been more stressed in the conclusions, is that um, most of the arts education activities are quite routine-like, and are too much routine-like. Most people in, in artistic, young people in artistic activities are told what to do. They are told to be creative, but they have to do this and that for, according to very strict schemes. Uh, and uh, music is a very clear example. Music is more an expression, an expression of discipline than of creativity. Um, in most cases, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it is, it's very difficult to, to link in terms of skills and cognitive operations and, and non-cognitive behavior, to link music with creativity and, and innovation. So there is, there is a link, but it can also be the reverse. Um, it, it depends very much on how um, 
music, for example, is, is thought and, and music classes are, um, are organized. Um, the field where we find the, the strongest relationships is, is uh, drama and theater. Um, and um, that's also obvious. Uh, in, in drama and theater, you have, um, well, young people are invited or are learned to express themselves, to um, develop uh, teamwork, to develop uh, complex communication skills. So um, this, this is quite significant impact uh, where the use of classroom drama um, has a positive impact on, on writing, on uh, oral understanding, on reading readiness, on reading achievement, oops, uh, on oral language, on vocabulary. So especially on, on language capacities and, and abilities, uh, drama has a very positive uh, impact. If you just look at the evidence, I think what the book suggests is that um, having drama as a, as a classroom activity absolutely has a very positive impact. Um, it's much less clear for the other domains. There is also some interesting research analyzed in the book on the visual arts, painting and etc. And there is, there is a link between painting and sculpture and, uh, and uh, mathematics in the terms of um, spatial intelligence. Um, so there are specific sets of links, but the, the very clear case is that of, um, of drama. We have done that analysis um, also because many people think that the arts are, can only be important if they contribute to the more academic skills development. That's not what we aim to, 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 to say, but that's an important uh, question to, to, to be disclosed by research. So that's why we have done this analysis. There are, of course, a couple of theories and a couple of concepts behind this thinking of what, what can arts education contribute to skills development and skills transfer. Um, there is a very interesting area of research, and this is exploding for the moment, more the, the brain research and the neurological research. Um, it's an area where we do a lot of work as well. Um, but it's, it's so fascinating and it's so rapidly evolving. Um, it's also very, um, you have to be very careful for two simple conclusions. There is now a kind of fashion of um, telling teachers, brain research tells you this and that and that, like, like this is already conclusive. And so brain research is still in its infancy. Uh, and although it's, it's fascinating and, and I'm, I'm I'm bewildered myself by, by looking at it, uh, but there, are, there is this really very high danger of very rapid, very easy conclusions. But still, this uh, neurological brain research kind of field is, um, is very interesting. Then you have more the field of cognitive psychology, um, which looks at the, the way that learning in an art trains cognitive skills that are also used in non-arts uh, domains. So that's, that's really the field of cognitive transfer. What, and so if you train certain abilities, then these abilities are also demonstrated in other uh, kinds of um, fields. Then there is the argument that um, art learning contributes to training social skills. Um, I would say this depends on the way that arts education is organized. It's not by definition that working with arts trains social skills, but of course you can very well organize arts education in such a way that it develops social skills. If you invite young people to, to work collaboratively um, and to include um, complex interaction challenges in, into the setting of your arts education, then uh, it is of, of course very, relevant. And then the final argument, which is also important, is about motivation, that arts education um, really motivates young people to learn uh, because it addresses them 
in a different way as human beings than normal school subjects and normal school life does. So it's a kind of enrichment of the school environment or the learning environment which also has a strong impact on their motivation and then this motivation in turn spills over to let's say the more traditional, the more cognitive kind of challenges uh, at school. Uh, I, I think this is true. I think uh, arts education can certainly uh, enrich uh, the learning experience and uh, I personally think that arts education should be part of any school curriculum only by, for this argument alone, but there are many other arguments as well, of course. Okay, um, a short excursion on uh, creativity, because as I said in the beginning, we would like to continue this kind of research, but focusing more specifically on this very difficult field of uh, creativity, and yeah, there is a huge literature on creativity, but there is unfortunately no agreement at all about the definition of it and, and the way to measure it or the way to assess it. Um, and we have collaborated uh, strongly with an English team and we have published it in a working paper which is also available for those of you who would be interested. Um, and we have tried to work with them to make our own definition of what creativity is. It's not really a definition, it's just m mapping the diverse dimensions included in that concept of creativity. Um, and the, we, we call them habits of mind. Um, so it's not really skills, but it's more like dispositions, like um, yeah, habits of mind. And we think that creativity has a dimension which is inquisitive, another which is persistent, and that's often underestimated. And in, in many Many people working on creativity have something like creativity is, is anything goes. Uh, and if it's boring, that just stop and do something else. We believe that there is a very important element of persistence in, in creativity. Um, many, the, every great artistic expression is also the fruit of hard labor, of being very persistent in achieving uh, an imagination or expression or whatever. So persistence being very important, collaboration, discipline, and imagination. And each of these fields have three habits of minds. Um, and then these, so these are more specific and we can define them better. So, and if we define something in a better way, then we can also measure it in a better way. Um, so, in the inquisitive habit of mind is wondering and questioning, exploring, investigating, challenging assumptions. And you see that we come very close to the kind of innovation skills that I mentioned in the beginning. Persistence, managing uncertainty, again the concept of uncertainty. Sticking with difficulty, daring to be different, imaginative, playing with possibilities, making connections, using intuition, discipline, crafting, improving, developing techniques. The technical element in the arts is of course always very important. Eh? So um, reflecting critically and then collaborative, cooperating appropriately, giving and receiving feedback and sharing uh, the product. So if, if then we have these 15 subhabits of mind which are specific enough to be measured, then we um, can move forward and we have developed a kind of self-assessment tool which has been in, a, in just a very limited experimental um, design being tested in, in a, some English uh, primary schools. It's based on self-assessment, so pupils uh, are confronted with two sets of, uh, of situations and they have to locate themselves uh, on, on a scale. Um, it's still very much in development, but it's, look, it's looking quite promising. And while well, we are now in this, every two years we have to submit our program of work to our governing board, uh, and we have included uh, also work for the next program of work, 2015, 2016, to really go forward on this um, idea of being able to measure creativity. 
and I hope I will be back in a couple of years with the results of that research. Okay, coming to a few conclusions. Um, it's only one slide with conclusions. Uh, first of all, uh, I ask you to remember from this talk that there is a very strong demand to be expected for what we can call innovation skills. Uh, so this, the, the kind of skills that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, there is evidence, but there is also a problem of having strong enough evidence from experimental design, but there is evidence pointing to associations between arts education and the development of these kind of skills. Um, so, as I said, causality is a big question still, uh, and detailed research about the precise pathways of how that transfer, for example, between music and, and mathematics is happening, this kind of uh, detailed research is, is still very much missing. Um, so we need much more systematic assessment of creativity and the development of creativity through arts education. Not only arts education, I don't think that arts education has the monopoly on, on the development of innovation skills or creativity or whatever, but it can have a very important contribution. And very important um, because if when we have worked on this field, um, we have also asked ourselves, but it's not really written down because it's more perception than, than really an analysis, but that the quality of arts education, the quality of how arts are organized in schools, but maybe also in youth work, actually is not very high. It's just sometimes just keeping children busy with what is perceived to be artistic activities. Uh, so the, like with any other subject field, the teaching and learning process has to be very high quality in order to realize those objectives of skills development and, and teamwork, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's, a, I think, a very important element as well. But then I'm, I'm coming to the end because when we have done this analysis, um, I we think it's very important analysis on transfer to other fields. Um, we still wanted to bring very much the, the important conclusion that arts education is not to be seen as instrumental. It is, of course, first of all, important by itself. Um, arts education and the arts in, it, in itself in society is not to be considered, like many policymakers do these days, as a, a sector which is contributing to the economic value of a country, or it's not in school life to be seen only because it could have a positive impact on mathematics. Of course, arts is very much important in itself. So the question mark in the title is deliberate, and of course the answer to that question is positive. Arts for art's sake, yes. But it can also have very important overflow effects to, to other uh, domains of skills um, development. So it is also an end in itself, and it's, of course, a very important part of the development and the learning trajectory of any human being and any society. Thank you so much. That's a. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, it's good.
notion this very clear and restrained um, uh, report, and I think that makes the evidence that is there all the stronger for that. So I welcome that. Um, one of the most interesting things for me from, from your presentation, which really questions them all, um, is um, that you emphasize how really it's, it's the situation that's created. So arts and education is not enough just to say have more of it. It's all about how does it happen? What, are, what is the, the, the system put in place? How is it done? Um, and in, in that respect, and I actually think that, you know, firstly, the mind that where a youth arts happen in a youth work setting, you, you, you agree from the, the tyranny of assessment and all of the, the, const, the, 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 um, the restrictions that we have in, in formal education. And I would be interested to know from the study, because I know it looked into non formal situations also. Was there any evidence of correlation um, between an increase in the causality between um, the arts education experience and the skills when it was happening in a non formal setting? Or is that perhaps research that could have happened? Okay. okay. Well, these two are already big enough. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll start with the second one. Um, uh, I have done a lot of work in myself because I'm, I'm not originally um, an educational researcher in the school sector. I, I have worked more on adult education uh, and on non-formal education in general. So uh, I know the field of uh, non-formal education and informal learning quite well. It's certainly an under-researched field, so we still don't have the kind of research that, that we need in order to really value the contribution of non-formal settings and informal learning uh, on, on, on development of young people and, and skills, etc. Um, so my, my easy answer would be, I don't know. Um, but from what I know from, let's say, the non-formal sector, of course, based on my own experience in Belgium, is um, that it's doing a lot of very valuable work, but it sometimes takes itself very easy. So the, the, the challenges of organizing non-formal learning settings to be optim optimally conducive to learning are higher, in my view, than in a formal learning setting, where a lot of the structural requirements are just given and provided. You have to be there in a class for a certain amount of time. There is a certain curriculum to follow. There is an assessment, etc. All these structuring elements are not there, or not at least to the same level, um, in non-formal settings. So people easily think that learning happens anyway. Um, but that has to do also with yeah, educational theory. There is, there is very strong fashionable development in educational theory for the idea that learning is taking place automatically. Um, but learning researchers are now coming back from that very optimistic idea, uh, which is included in constructivist thinking. Um, I'm, I don't know whether you are educational <laughs> uh, informed enough to know what constructivism is, but it's the, let's say, the most dominant theory about learning uh, today, and it has a couple of very, what we more and more see as too optimistic ideas. And the optimistic ideas are also very much prevalent in, in non-formal settings, um, that you just have to provide opportunities to people and that then learning happens automatically. Uh, and I don't think that's true. You have to, um, without becoming formalized, you have to spend a lot of energy in designing and organizing what actually happens in non-formal settings. And that's certainly a topic um, which needs to be researched much more, but which go is going to be very important in the future. Um, that's, that's all that I can answer to your question, but my, a simple uh, question, my simple answer would be, don't take it too lightly that non-formal settings can be very conducive to, to developing this kind of uh, skills. 
So to move from just keeping children busy to providing interesting learning opportunities which really help people forward, especially the, the least advantaged ones, that requires a lot of organizational uh, design, uh, etc. So that's my main message. Your first question, um, well, there was a lot of thinking around that kind of issues. Why have all these innovative companies emerged in, in the US and, and much less so uh, in Europe? Um, in general, I would not say that the European economy is less innovative, but it's expressing it in a different way. Uh, it's much less focused at these companies which just start and then grow enormously. Uh, so, but I would say that the level of innovation in, in European economy and society is of a different nature than in the, in, in the, in the US. Um, but of course, you have these marvelous examples of, of, of Google and et cetera. I would not consider Amazon to be a, a really good example of innovation because it's very much a, an industrial model. Uh, of uh, it's, it's just acquiring a huge share of the market, but it's not imaginative or creative in its production process. In fact, there was just a, a, a documentary on the television on the production methods of Amazon and its worse than 19th century capitalism factories, I think. But that's another story. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think in the, in the US there is, of course, a lot of room for people, individuals with that kind of creativity, imagination, and uh, I would say that the biggest distinction is individualism, but also risk-taking behavior. Um, but against every um, person who succeeds in building Facebook or Google, there is a million of people who fail. Um, so, but risk-taking, I consider risk-taking um, to be, um, let's say, uh, something which is not yet fully developed in Europe, uh, which we should encourage much more. So, do we, but I didn't include entrepreneurship and, and risk-taking in my set of innovation skills, but there are many people who say you should include that also. Um, and of course, there are some, uh, some good arguments. But in, I think the main um, barrier to, to move our economies in, in that kind of innovation orientation is, is uh, avoidance of, of risk-taking. 